All right, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds again. This is our last Grand Rounds of April, and we're lucky to have Dr. Goswami this morning. She's, as you all know, a third-year resident who is almost finished and will be going to L.A. to do a fellowship in pediatric rheumatology. Today she's talking about uh, weakness and rashes in children. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys all hear me? Yep. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, like I said, I'm Dr. Goswami. Thanks for the introduction. So my topic is weakness and rash. I have no disclosures, but I did want to thank everybody that helped me put this presentation together, the adult rheumatologists here, and then at Duke and CHLA for giving me extra resources that were available to them. So the objectives of my talk are defining the clinical picture of juvenile dermatomyositis, briefly reviewing the pathophysiology of this disease, classifying the differentials, and reviewing the current management guidelines, which are constantly changing. Rheumatology. So, I have a three-year-old girl with decreased activity, decreased appetite, and refusal to sit on the floor. She has been kind of going through a lot the last couple months. Uh, about seven months ago, her dad got integrated, and mom pertained a lot of her behavioral changes to being related to that. About a month ago, mom said, you know, she's starting to ask me to carry her a lot, which is different than usual. She usually loves to run around and play. Um, she has a little one-year-old sister. Every morning, they usually sit down on the floor together and play with toys, and she started asking mom to give her a little chair to sit on. She's like, I don't want to sit on the floor. Can you get me a chair? So mom's like, that's different. And then slowly after that, she started saying, well, my legs are really hurting. She would cry and say, my legs are hurting. But she couldn't point to where it would hurt. She would just point all over it, everywhere. Um, she stopped walking to the bathroom. Mom would have to carry her to the bathroom. In terms of her diet, she said she was already a picky eater to start with. I mean, she's a three-year-old. But she started saying um, she didn't want to eat anymore. So mom was like, well, let me try to make your favorite dishes that I know you like. So spaghetti and meatballs, she tried to make her those. And she still would refuse to eat completely. She started to just drink liquids, mostly milk and water and juice. Um, mom noticed even when she would try to drink, she was drooling a little bit more than usual afterwards, which is strange for her. And I believe that's about the majority of her story. So I showed this picture of a little boy. So she was kind of doing this whenever they did sit on the floor, and she did have some strength. She would try to get up um, using the Gower's maneuver, like many of us know. So on physical exam, when she came to the hospital, she was acting appropriate, awake, a little nervous, but did become cooperative as we started doing the exam. Um, HENT was normal. Her neck exam, she didn't have any lymph nodes. She had full range of motion of her neck. But she was leaning against mom when we saw her on the bed and when we would try to get her to come off of mom's back or her chest, then you would notice that she would have a little bit of a head lag and she couldn't like quite hold her head up the whole time. Um, respiratory exam was normal, clear to auscultation, no wheezes or rails or crackles. Um, she had a normal heart exam, except she did have a two out of six systolic ejection murmur, which was new. Mom had never heard of her having a murmur prior to this. It was located at the left upper sternal border her abdominal exam was normal. She had normal bowel sounds, soft non tender, and extremities did not show any inflammation of any joints or any warmth or redness. So her neuro exam, um, she was alert and appropriate, able to answer questions and follow commands without any difficulties. She was able to do, we did finger to object because she was so nervous, so we had her play with her toys and try to do that with us. Um, when doing that, we did notice she had a little bit less strength in her left hand. She kind of dropped it down a little bit as she went up to pick up the object. Um, she was uncooperative with a lot of the strength te te testing. Um, she would try to do her leg exam just to bend her knees and move her legs around. She would kick you away and just start kicking rapidly in the bed. Um, when trying to do her upper extremities, we would try to abduct her arms and see how she would do with that. And you would literally get just like a little bit away from her body and she would start screaming and crying. In terms of her skin exam, so she had capillary period on her on her left digits, the third and fourth. Um, and then she had a non fluidic bilateral axillary rash that was like flat with small little ulcerations if you looked really closely. We looked even with an otoscope sometimes. Um, she had a little bit of ecchymosis starting on her left knee, and she had an erythematous halo around both of her eyes with telangiopasia on her upper eyelids. And then lastly, she did have some superficial capillaries on her cheekbones. So her initial labs when she was admitted to the pediatric floor, um, she got a CDC, a CMP, and a factor eight that was initially resulted. 
Um, if you look at, I try to write the significant ones on the table. So the H and H, her hemoglobin was 10.3, hematocrit 33.3, platelets were 284, her white count was 6.65, ESR was surprisingly 23, and CRP was 0.5. You go down, the ones in bold are the ones that were out of the normal range. So her ASC was elevated at T13, ALT was 82, her LDH was 2311, and her CPK was 4597. Her alveolase was slightly elevated, their cutoff was 8, and hers was 9.5. So she had an MRI done shortly after this. Um, after we were consulted, we went ahead and arranged for the MRI for the pediatric rheumatology team. And you can see here, it's a little bit different than the normal MRI. Let's try to use the pointer. So if you look at the um, subcutaneous fat tissues, you see the enhancements with the, um, on both sides of her legs and even on the inner sides. So that's the inflammation in her subcutaneous tissue. In addition to this, you see the nice white lining around her muscles. And as well as between the muscles, you can kind of see that little streaking. <coughs> so this is a pretty impressive MRI. Um, I have one more view. This one shows you a little bit more of that subcutaneous fat inflammation. So she had a little bit of everything. She had muscle inflammation, subcutaneous inflammation, and even the whole muscle bundle. There's like that really tight line around it. So what's the indication for the MRI in this case? What, are you trying, what else are you trying to figure out? I don't quite understand. Because your, your labs say you have muscle inflammation. Right. So for, can you wait a little bit? I was like, because I'll get there. I was like, do I want to answer this now? Um, but yes, I will get there. It's one of the ways to help get to the final diagnosis. So differentials. Um, this could be a wide differential. Having the MRI with you, it already kind of helps you narrow it down. But um, usually you want to go through the different systems and the different types of disease processes that could be occurring. So initially you would obviously go to the inflammatory myopathies. So this could be a juvenile dermatomyositis versus a polymyositis. Anything infectious that could trigger these, there are viruses and bacterial and parasitic infections that you need to rule out if you jump to the JDM or polymyositis. There's also the non-inflammatory myopathies, so like we know about the dystrophies, uh, myotonic disorders, periodic paralysis, any trauma, toxins, or drug-induced myopathies. And then systemic rheumatic diseases, so you want to look for lupus, scleroderma, especially because she has the rashes. Uh, JIA if she had joint involvement, mixed connective tissue disease, or vasculitis. And then anything mimicking cutaneous conditions, so psoriasis, eczema, allergy. Oddly enough, in our patient, um, she did have that periorbital rash previously before any other symptoms started, and they told her it was eczema, and we're treating it with topical steroids. So it was coming and going. And then you want to look at genetic and metabolic enzymatic diseases, so anything with glycogen storage diseases, lipid storage diseases, and mitochondrial myopathies. So at this point, knowing this differential and knowing our patient, what do you think our patient has? JDF. Yeah. So juvenile dermatomyositis. So I have never seen this picture, and I thought it was a useful one to have in your mind when you're thinking of someone with JDF. Um, it kind of shows you the different organisms involved, which I will go into more detail after this, but just to highlight. So there's the skin findings with the facial rash. There is some GI involvement, which you can see the yellow, and then the lung involvement can be there in kids, but more in adults. And then the muscles and then joints. So briefly, going over demographics, 16 to 20% of patients are diagnosed with dermatomyositis in childhood. About 3.2 cases are per 1 million children. It's less marked in children. Um, if you look at adults, it's more common in African Americans than Caucasians, and there's an average four-year incidence rate when comparable for whites and blacks, but lower for Hispanics. The peak age is usually 5 to 14 years. Again, there's a second peak onset and later in life around 45 to 64 <coughs> years of age. The median age of onset is around seven years um, with a ratio of 2.2 females to one male. Um, I have this graph that I thought depicted this kind of nicely for us. So the light gray bars that you see is for girls and the dark gray is for boys. So per this graph, which is taken from the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Skin Diseases, they say girls, the mean age of onset was about 6.74 with plus or minus 3.5, and, 
for their standard deviation, and for boys, it was about 7.3, plus or minus almost four years. So um, JDM can be a result of an environmental trigger in genetically susceptible individuals. Studies show some antecedent URI or GI illness precede the symptoms of the onset of JDM symptoms. Um, some of these that have been studied a little bit further, Coxsackie, um, there have been studies that show if you, about 83% of patients that had been infected with Coxsackie virus did show signs of early JDM. Influenza and parainfluenza had a similar study done that showed um, both of these titer levels were elevated in their control groups of patients, and they all had JDM that was triggered shortly after. Um, parvovirus is one of those that they checked with a control group and a study group, and looking at the elevations in the titers, they're actually both equally elevated, so it wasn't a very useful study, so they're probably going investigate, to investigate those a little bit more. Um, but other causes could be group-based stress, toxo, hepatitis B, Borrelia, and Leishmania. So there is an association with HLA alleles. Uh, the three that are listed are the most common for JDM. Um, and then there's also cytokine polymorphism um, that can be common in these patients. Another thing is some of these, some patients with like A-gamma globulinemia can present with early like, JDM-like symptoms, but you have to make sure you rule that out before you get to the point of calling them a JDM. Also patients with low C2 complements and having um, any other sort of autoimmune-like deficiencies can be more likely, like IgA deficiency, which looks like a JDM patient. So non-infectious exposure, so medications can cause up to 18%. These medications usually co consist of, like, the deep penicillamines, sulfa medications, um, those specific, specifically, sometimes even doxycycline. Uh, photosensitizing or myopathic immunizations cause up to 11%. So immunizations that are included are having the flu vaccine, um, hepatitis sometimes, or even the diphtheria. And then DCG, when it was given, used to commonly show up with this. Uh, stressful life events show up in 7%. Unusual sun exposure is for 7%. And chemicals, animal contact, weight training, and diet supplements is less than 5%. So clinically, they usually show a progression of malaise and weight loss, and obviously the fatigue is ongoing and then progresses. Um, muscle weakness is symmetrical proximal muscles, so you usually see limb girdle muscles affected the most. Uh, fever can be intermittent throughout the illness. Uh, rashes, so we'll talk about this a little bit more, and I'll show you some pictures. But the Gottron's rash, the heliotropic rash, the malar rash, and the photosensitive rash. And usually this, these symptoms all occur over a three to six month period only acute onset occurs in about one-third of the patients that present. And there is a variation in the extent of the evolution of the clinical symptoms based on the patient. So the more severe, they may have some pharyngeal and palatal muscle involvement. Um, sometimes you'll notice they'll have a nasally voice. They may have difficulty swallowing, or in our patient, you notice a drooling when she would try to eat and drink things. Sometimes they can choke on their food and actually aspirate. And they may have some signs of dysphonia, so their voice gets softer. With older patients, you can do this by having them count to 10. And by the time they get to like five to seven, you'll notice their voice is kind of fading and getting to a higher pitch. In younger kids, it's harder to do this, so usually you listen to their cry. Listen to them start crying, and as they get further on, you'll notice the pitch will change. Oops, sorry. Um, so here I have um, a childhood myositis assessment scale. This is one of the handouts that are back there on the table if you guys wanted to get a copy. Um, this is a way for us to assess the progression of their disease and if they are improving or worsening. It's really blurry up here, so I try to get a copy back there if you can. Um, so I encourage you guys to look at this and try to just see what they're looking at. So the first one, for example, is looking at the head lift. So you lie down on a table and you want them to just lift their head off the table and you take a timer and you time it up to two minutes is good. A normal healthy person can hold their head up for two minutes. It's hard. We've all tried to do it before and it's exhausting. Like you will start shaking. If you talk, it makes it harder. But so imagining trying to get a five-year-old to do this is very difficult. But you have to pump them up and make it a game and um, it's very interesting to see. So a lot of them aren't that difficult, like raising your arms for that long. It's much easier than your head. But I encourage you to all try the head lift. <laughs> 
is something you can use in every appointment they come to for follow-up. This will be something you'll use as a reassessment to see where they are in their medication. Do they need to wean? Do you need to add? So that'll be helpful. The other one is a classification criteria for idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. I thought this would be interesting to share with all of you. Um, it's a link that's available online through the American College of Rheumatology. And if you're not sure which category of myopathies the patient falls into, you can kind of select the boxes um, that may be pertinent to the patient. So say they're a pediatric patient and they do have a heliotropic rash and they have got transpapules, they're already at a 45 to 100% probability of having that because it's so definitive. Like when you have that heliotropic rash, they're likely to have dermatomyositis. So it's a good resource to have. Again, it's from the American College of Rheumatology. Um, so back to the picture I initially showed you with the organ systems involved. So generally they will have some fevers and fatigue. Some may have arthritis. It's not common in every single patient, especially in pediatrics. You may see it down the road. Um, GI systems can be involved. So they have some dysphagia. They can have GI ulcerations as well as perforation. One thing that a lot of people don't think about is these patients are at risk for perforation and they should be on Miralax daily lifetime. Um, that should not be a medication that's removed from their regimen just because they're having normal stool because they are always going to be at risk for that. Um, slow progressive loss of sub-Q and visceral fat is noticed in the upper body and face with hypertriglyceridinemia, insulin resistance, acanthosis, nigricans, hypertension, and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Lungs, so some patients can, this is more common in adults, um, but they can have a restricted <coughs> interstitial lung disease depending on the type of antibodies they show which we'll go into a little bit further, um, may put them at risk for developing this. In terms of cardiac, so some patients may develop murmurs or cardiomegaly. About 25 to 50% of patients develop hypertension. Um, Nonspecific tachycardia can be seen in some of these, and they may develop a cardiomyopathy. Lastly, in terms of kidneys, um, they can have a microscopic hemoglobinuria related to a urine myoglobin at the onset, mostly. Here I have a picture for you that would be helpful. So vasculopathy is common in these patients. Viscerally, they will usually complain of diffuse, severe abdominal pain. They may have some melanar or hematemesis. Um, but in terms of capillary beds and their nail folds, the top left picture, I hope you can all see it, is a normal nail fold when you're looking with an otoscope or a dermatoscope. They do have such things. Um, and then the top right picture is showing you that you can see the little dots coming up of their capillary beds. And that's what you call a dropout. And then the bottom two pictures show you the worsening of the severity. So that's the tortuosity. You kind of see the squiggliness of all the vessels coming out. And that would show you the progression of the disease as well. Conjunctiva as well? Okay. Conjunctiva as well? Or? Not necessarily in the conjunctiva. It's harder to see that. I'm sure if you went to an ophthalmologist maybe, but we don't do it on a regular exam. So muscles, um, exudates are commonly present, infiltrating around the muscle body muscle bundles. Um, they will be infiltrated primarily with lymphocytes and monocytes. Inflammatory cells usually causing the inflammation and muscle death. So specifically for dermatomyositis, you'll see plasma cytoid dendritic cells that are thought to be activated by a viral nucleic acid or a self-DNA that release large amounts of type 1 interferons and lead to immune cell activation and vasculopathy. So sometimes there could be atrophy or necrosis of the periphery of the fascicle. Uh, concomitant degeneration and regeneration of muscle fibers occur. So if you look at a biopsy, which we will shortly, you can see that. Um, areas of focal necrosis are replaced during healing phases by interstitial proliferation of connective tissue. So here's an example of a muscle biopsy. You can see the infiltration definitely around the vessels um, as well as throughout the muscle bundles. And you can see the different sizes as well. Some of them are larger than others and more well-rounded. Others are kind of flattened out. Here's a table. I hope some of you can see it. Um, it compares uh, juvenile dermatomyositis with juvenile polymyositis. So in terms of histological findings, we kind of talked about some of them. So you have the muscle fiber atrophy, the capillary dropout, and then um, generating fibers. They usually, if you look under a electron micro microscopy, you can see overexpression of MHC class 1. And then cellular infiltrates, we talked about this. The plasmacytoid, dendritic cells, <coughs> macrophages, B cells, T cells are the most common. So if you're wondering if they could have a polymyositis because they don't have enough of the rash 
for you to diagnose them that way, you would see more CD8 T cells and the HLA class 1 over on the microscopy. So calcinosis. Um, cal it usually consists of calcium hydroxyapatite or carbonate apatite. So a smaller degree of magnesium can be present, which is a mineralization inhibitor. Um, the mineral is deposited in fragments and over time becomes solidified. So they can occur as a cutaneous, subcutaneous plaques or nodules, and they deposit into the muscle or the subcutaneous skin. And there's really subcutaneous and can spread. Um, sometimes you'll notice them along fascial planes, and that's what causes the contractures. And some of you are all thinking about the same patient that I am. Um, so it's common in patients with longer disease duration. So whether it be damage caused by long-standing disease activity versus the delay of diagnosis, those are the two most common thoughts for why patients de develop calcinosis. It's pretty rare to see someone with a new diagnosis to have calcinosis right then. It usually develops after about three years of having this disease. Um, so high-dose corticosteroid therapy with immunosuppressive agents can control ongoing inflammation. However, it does not prevent this from developing. It is also associated with higher levels of CPK, joint contractures, cardiac involvement, and one or more immunosuppressive therapies. Those phosphonates are being studied and thought to inhibit bone resorption and reducing the calcium levels turnover and may affect um, the macrophages and inflammatory cytokines on the calcinosis site. There have been a couple of studies that have looked into this further, and they have shown that some of them may have, some patients may have partial improvement of their calcinosis while some may resolve. So it varies per patient population, and it's still being further investigated, but it is a method to be tried. So initial labs that we would like our patients to get, um, if you're concerned about JDM, would be the muscle enzymes. You're probably wondering why are AST and ALT written under muscle enzymes? So when muscle break down, um, they do release actually AST and ALT, so we don't consider them part of the hepatic function panel. So you want to get a CK, ASC, ALT, LDH, and an aldolase. Inflammatory markers to look at, ESR and CRP. And like you notice in our patients, she actually had normal levels of these. So initially when they present, they don't always have sky-high ESRs. Um, hers developed like two, three weeks later. She started getting into the hundreds. But initially she had a 23. <coughs> so autoantibodies. So ANAs are positive in about 70% of the patients. Myositis specific antibodies, you can have three different types. So there's the anti synthetase, which is anti JO1, and this is present in about 5% of the patients. Um, and anti MI2 is in about 5% as well, and anti SSD is in less than 5%. Um, out of these three specifically, the anti JO1 is known to have the worst prognosis. They're the ones with more involvement systemically. And then the myositis associated antibodies, the P155 and P140 are um, in about 30% of the patients. However, when you look at the effects long-term, they tend to have more of the chronic disease courses, and as adults, are more likely to develop cancer. And then myositis with arthritis have the MDA5 antibodies. So these are the ones we were talking about earlier. They could have the restrictive interstitial lung disease development as they go through the disease process. So it's something to keep your eye on. And these are another group that have a worse prognosis because their arthritis is more erosive and damaging as well. So for the criteria, back to Dr. Key's question earlier, um, there's a Bohan and Peter diagnostic criteria that's used for JDM. So like we know, our patient has symmetric proximal muscle weakness. She had increased levels of the serum CK, ASC, LDH, and aldolase, all of the above. <laughs> um, EMG used to be a criteria that can be used to diagnose um, myopathy and denervation. Nowadays, you're noticing MRI is taking over EMGs in the classification studies. So if you have an MRI that shows enough that proximal enhancement of the limb girdle muscles and uh, subcutaneous tissue, then that's enough to replace that. Um, muscle biopsy usually, like we talked about, shows necrosis and fiber size variation, the infiltration of the inflammatory cells. Um, this is one of the ones that people are talking about like, not everyone wants to do a muscle biopsy if you already know. I don't think our patient ended up getting a muscle biopsy because we already knew at that point she already had so many criteria. And the last one is cutaneous changes of heliotropic rash and got transpapules. So if you have two of these five things, you're having possible JDM. If you have three of the five, it's probable. And if you have four of the five, you're definitive. They have JDM. So in our case, we didn't do the muscle biopsy because she already had four of the five. 
Here's an example of a heliotropic rash. So you see it's just like a light pinkish hue over their eyelids and even underneath. Um, and you can see there's really hard to see, but there may be small telangiectasia spots on the eyelids as well. In our patient, they actually did spread to her cheekbones. So it's a very light, like you have to look at them in the right light, not in a dark room, turn on all of the lights and look around. Um, sometimes pictures are good because some days they may look different than others, so looking through a parent's phones can help with this too. Here's an example of Gautron's papules. So you can see it's usually on your metacarpal phalangeal joint and then the if you see a rash like this in between in the interphalangeal region, it's less likely to be a gotcha fibula. It cannot be in, the, in between your joints. Um, so something to remember specifically for this. You will get the ulceration over time and actually become a papule. Initially, it may start out as just a rash. So you'll just see the erythema. So complications, uh, delay in diagnosis or lack of aggressive treatment can lead to a poor outcome. Muscle weakness and pain can lead to joint contractures. Soft tissue calcification developing within a few years of diagnosis or seeing at presentation, like we said, again, that's less likely. Um, lipoatrophy with hyperinsulinism, hypertriglyceridemia, liver dysfunction, acanthosis, nigricans, and type 2. <coughs> and then, of course, medication side effects from having corticosteroid toxicity. So treatment. Initially, for all of these patients, you want to try to get their symptoms under control. We usually start with doing steroids for three days. Um, so IV, and they get 30 mg per kg, the max of one gram. And then after that, you start corticosteroids orally daily. So like we do the one, mix per, one to two mg per kg per day with a slow taper. Usually the taper goal is about for over a year. If you can get them down that quickly, that's like aggressive, really trying then that's great. I mean, there's definitely some patients will try to wean them, and we'll talk about that in a second. IVIG can be used as a symptom control if you see them getting worse and having more cutaneous findings, especially. Some of them you can start that early. Um, methotrexate, uh, subcutaneous or oral weekly with folic acids is the go-to initial medication as like your controller, as we say in asthmatics. Um, and then you add that with the corticosteroids. The two of those combined can decrease the mortality of JVM by down to 1% to 2%. So just corticosteroids, they were up to like, I believe the numbers were 70%, so that does help a lot. Having IVIG, usually we're using it for cutaneous diseases. Um, these other ones listed below are dependent on the type of disease or if they're refractory. So MM6 and azathioprine are additional on adjunctive agents that can be used if everything else you're doing isn't working. Um, cyclosporine or rituximab have been used for resistance or refractory diseases. And there's actually a new study that just came out for rituximab being used in those patients with a lot of skin findings, and such as gotcham papules or the rashes and the telegiotasias. They can actually, they studied between pediatric patients and adults, and they said both of them had in significant improvement using the rituximab in addition to the methotrexate and corticosteroids. And then lastly, cyclophosphamide can be used for interstitial lung disease or vasculitis. So this is the generic things that you go over, kind of like you do in pediatric patients, but um, in JDM patients, you have your specific things that every JDM patient should be doing. So skin protection is a big thing. Sun exposures can trigger a um, reactivation of their disease process and worsening of the rashes. So you want to really go into um, using sunblock more than SPF 30. Make sure they wear a hat and cover their body with good sun protection clothing. Um, you want to avoid going out during peak daylight hours. And then physical therapy, definitely depending on the extent of the patient's disease, of course, but you want to make sure that they're able to work on exercising and strengthening those muscles, learning how to stretch them so they don't get into that phase of getting contracted or having significant weakness that affects their daily living. Lastly, speech and diet, these could kind of go together. So like in our patient, she was struggling with eating solid foods and was more on a liquid diet. So you would want to give parents education on how to prepare the foods to make sure they're getting the nutrition they need and also what the safety is for them as well. And the patient would learn how to compensate for all those losses that they're having and their abilities as well. So this is a table that we can use. Um, it shows the different pathways for the progression of the disease and how you would go by every visit for follow-up. So usually your initial treatment plan, say we use corticosteroids and methotrexate. Then you would say, come back in a month for a follow-up. And they come back in a month, you would look at 
there are three different sections. I'm going to start with if they worsen. Um, so by your judgment, using that scale that I showed you earlier, kind of run through a few of those and see, you know, where are they at this time compared to last time, and then decide maybe they need some additional therapy. That could be just doing an extra steroid dosing, or it could be adding an extra immunomodulating agent, so some IVIG or other immunosuppression that we talked about before. And so once you add those on, you can recheck them again in four weeks and see. So it's always every four weeks, and then if they're doing better, then you can start spacing it out. Um, so if they're doing better, we'll go to that side. So if they're improved, you can discuss this, um, weaning the steroids over the 12-month period like we talked about if they're tolerating it. Now, some patients will bounce back and get worse while you're trying to wean. So you might do a really small wean then. The, the art of weaning steroids is very interesting. Everyone does it very differently. There's no, like, protocol, like, this is how you should wean it by step-by-step, -step, by this percentage, because every rheumatologist I feel does it a little bit But, um, and then, again, if they're unchanged, you can decide to hold it there, their treatment at that point and reassess in four weeks and decide if you need to go up or down. So outcomes, 40 to 60 percent of the patients have a chronic disease course. Uh, persistence of rash and nail fold changes are seen for about the first six months. Um, favorable outcomes, most kids without functional disability, and less than 10 percent with moderate to severe disability. So I know we all think about the one patient we know here, and you see how severe it is. Most of these kids come and they're acting like normal kids. You would never know that they have GDM. And then here's a table that um, shows you the difference between pediatrics and adults. Um, the biggest thing that I wanted to point out was the calcinosis is more common to see in pediatrics versus adults. The refractory disease is um, equal between the two groups. Malignancy is more common in adults, and then myositis-specific antibodies are a little bit more common in adults than pediatric patients. Interstitial lung disease, again, more in adults. Um, GI disease, Raynaud's are kind of similar in both groups, and mortality was more significant in the adults as well. So back to our patient. So she remained in the hospital for about three months due to having respiratory depression. I had done the rotation out there for a month, and she was my patient for three weeks. And right when I left, she got intubated and sent to the PICU. Um, and she was in the PICU for a couple weeks after that and then got, got back out to the floor. Um, then slowly they worked with her with physical therapy, with speech therapy, everything. And she, over a couple months, developed um, her batch on papules because she just had that one ecchymosis spot, waiting for it to go into something else. Um, so after the papules and then increased tone to Asia, she was started on with Tuximab. She got two courses of Tuximab, but that was it, and then continued on her methotrexate and steroids. So she total was an inpatient rehab for six months, and then now she's back to her normal self and playing. You wouldn't know anything otherwise. So I have a video. Um, this is something that can show you how long and how hard it is for the disease progression in the families and like the lifestyle of the patient. I think it's very interesting to see. So this is right before she got diagnosed. Her arm hurts. Okay. Please just concentrate. I know. But please concentrate as you're in fall. Can you use the other leg to go down? One more. She's not able to take that step and hold herself. She has to really catch herself. She's using the railing a lot to help her. Thank you, like Sylvie. Okay. Mm. All right. Okay. Turn around. That's the part that was surprising. Turn real hard. Use your legs. Put music to the video. 
you can see she's doing better. She has more strength. Definitely still dependent on using that extra support from her upper body to get her up the stairs. And this is pretty close to the end of her treatment process. She's almost back to her normal self. She's like, I'm ready. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> After this video, they like go outside and play, and she's like running around playing football. So she had a lot of energy. <laughs> but it gives you the idea of the disease progression and how they do improve. So these are my objectives, again, that we talked about. And thank you. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> A great presentation. Can, can you comment on the um, frequency of chelation for some of the calcium treatments specifically where you get profound calcium deposition? It's what do we use, success rate, et cetera? So um, the one study that I looked at was specifically with the bisphosphonates being used. Um, the success rate was like 50-50. Like some of them had um, full recovery. The calcium had gone away completely while others only had partial. So it was like it varies per patient. I don't think there's enough studies out that really show the specific success rate. Anyone's on anywhere that wants to add to this? You're welcome to. <laughs> I had a question about um, IVIG. Uh, it sounds like that's used more for cutaneous when there's cutaneous manifestations. Is there a certain threshold of those findings that would lend to, to wanting to do that therapy? I would think that initially, usually you always start, like, even in our patients, she had the cutaneous findings initially, um, but we didn't start with IVIG, even though the initial baseline starting of any medications is always corticosteroids and the methotrexate. I think the IVIG would come if they had more significant, like, maybe if they had gotcha and that weren't responding to anything else from the beginning, then you would consider starting the IVIG a little bit sooner. Um, with our patient that we all share who's reaching adulthood, um, I had a question just about, honestly, life expectancy and prognosis because I feel like that's come up a lot and we haven't had a good discussion with that specific patient. I know a lot of it's going to depend on their complications from their treatment, but did you find anything that would be an indicator for a worse? For her, that patient specifically, um, the fact that the calcinosis has led to significant contractures and like widespread and she's at risk for having more infections with her sores and I've talked about that patient with many other current rheumatologists and they even say it sounds very poor prognosis but no one can give me an idea of the extent like what would be her average lifespan. That's hard to say. Sorry, that's a hard question to answer. Um, another question is uh, we frequently have used rituximab because of its frequency and it's got a track record and so mm -hmm. forth. But in this day and age, there's so many, uh, at least for other conditions, CLL specifically, that that's sort of gone, been displaced by a benetunumab. And so it's not as toxic for the patient in my case. So you know, where I could just get uh, a benetunumab and get great response without having to take all the poison, including mm -hmm. rituximab. What's new on the horizon for <laughs> monoclonal? How does, how does a rituximab directly help at a mechanistic level, and and what other alternatives are being explored in terms of is obinutinumab or other sorts of specific, um, you know, monoclonal specific, you know, cellular killers of some of these things that are, are there anything that you can share with us? So the specific mechanism of the rituximab, I can't tell you because that study actually just came out November 2016 for doing that as a specifically for patients with the more skin disease findings um, clinically. So they didn't look at the specific monoclonal antibody and how it reacted with the disease course. So I don't know the answer to that either. Um, but for the newer ones, 
I don't know any off the top of my head. I know Rituximab has been one that people have been using for several years, and it hasn't been studied. So now we're finally getting to the study phase. So a lot of the ones that we are using for treatment aren't studied initially. Because a lot of people don't want to put their patients, especially pediatrics, they don't want to give their kids something that hasn't been studied before. So it takes a while to get patients to start agreeing. Um, I don't have, like, an example for this, like, for JDM specifically, but an example would be for psoriatic arthritis in kids. Like, we started using, I can never say it, sucukinumab, and they started using that because in adults it's shown to work for psoriatic arthritis, but it's never been studied in kids. So we took articles to the patient's family and showed them everything, and we're like, would you like to try this? And they agreed, actually. So then they did this. Uh, they did the course, and she improved. But um, it's not like it was published, and that's the hard part, to get to the point of publishing something like that. It takes a while. So I don't have anything new for dermatomyositis right now. The red text is probably the newest, for specifically for skin clinical manifestations. Let me grow the conditions. Is there a bottle of world specific immunologic disorder? Not so much. Um, we, the newest one is an anti IL 5 that recently came out, and there's going to be a combination anti IL 5, IL 13 um, for asthma, and that stupilumab will be um, their studies. That's why I repeated. You can identify the inflammatory markers. Yeah, again, especially, I mean, again, I do mostly allergy and stuff, but they tend to be the more of the um, TH2 <coughs> cytokines, IL-5, IL-13, um, and IL, the anti-IL-5 <coughs> is on the market right now. And so we've got a couple of kids on it. Um, it's getting insurances to cover, but, um, yeah. Any other questions in the room? We've got a few minutes. I can unmute the phone. Right. <clears throat> if you're on the line and you have a question, uh, I'll mute the phone here in just a second. If you do not have a question, if you would mute your phone now so that we don't uh, hear any background noise. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay, the phone lines are open if anyone has a question. Going once, going twice. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. If you're still on the line and you did have a question, uh, you can always email us at outreach at perennialclinic.org. Dr. Goswami, go ahead and disconnect the phone lines now. Thank you all very much for joining us.